Okay, for, for like today, phytosterol, it means require the knowledge of uh, cholesterol, which is basically the knowledge of biochemistry and knowledge of organic uh, chemistry. Um, so it's a combination of biochemistry and organic chemistry. And all at the same time, if you are learning about probiotics, even prebiotics, you need a, a very strong knowledge of uh, microbiology. So it depends on what kind of functional ingredients you are dealing with. So today we are going to talk about uh, phytosterol, which is um, a functional ingredient associated with uh, reduction in blood cholesterol. Before we go on, I just like to read a little bit about uh, the basics about cholesterol, because cholesterol is the uh, what we call uh, biomarkers that we use in our body to indicate the effectiveness of this uh, bioactive compounds, phytosterol. Okay, we know cholesterol is the precursor of all other steroids in the body, um, corticosteroids, sex hormones, bile acids, vitamin D. Also important amphiphatic lipid, which allows cholesterol to play structural role in membrane. That means our membrane has cholesterol in the outer layer of lipoproteins. So this is where the cholesterol and phytosterol share a similar role, yeah? Somewhere in the, the membranes uh, of the, uh, the structure of the membranes. That's where um, cholesterol in human, uh, phytosterol in plants. And number two, um, we know excess cholesterol is excreted from the liver in the bile. Yeah, we learn you learn nutrition. You recall what is bile? Uh, this excess cholesterol removed from the liver as uh, in the bile as cholesterol or bile salts. A large proportion of bile salts is absorbed into the portal circulations and return to the liver as part of the enteropathic circulation. So uh, cholesterol being uh, returned to the liver as part of the enterohepatic. So we want to reduce this absorption of bile salts. And finally, number three, elevated levels, too much cholesterol, presence in very low density lipoprotein VLDL, and low density lipoprotein LDL are associated with atherosclerosis, whereas high level of uh, high density HDL have protective effect. All right. So in order for to maintain to to, to make our health um, improve or better, we want to reduce the bad cholesterol, the LDL. So today. We're going to talk about phytosterol, our friend, to combat excess cholesterol. So phytosterol has been defined as a, a, a group of lipid-like compounds found in plants, of course. That's why the name phytosterol, which is opposite of cholesterol. So, of course, if people are selling vegetable oil, they cannot declare it as uh, zero cholesterol because it is true, it is, there's no cholesterol there. But there is still phytosterol in that particular oil, which is actually the cousin of cholesterol. Okay, and this phytosterol has been shown to prove clinically to reduce blood cholesterol. In fact, in the United States, consumption of 2 grams a day of phytosterol has been advised by United States National Cholesterol Education Programs. And if you check your food act and regulations, uh, phytosterol is there as uh, something that you, you can, you are allowed to make. Um, nutrient claim, structural function claim, uh, not, not health claim, yeah, not in Malaysia anyway. Okay, down with number one. So, okay. I'm trying to move to the next page. Okay. 
Uh, today, the, the learning outcome is simple. Uh, we learn, we're going to learn about basic properties, maybe efficacy and safety of phytosterol. And then the more important one is the challenges during formulations, why it is so important. Um, there are product examples, of course. There are many product examples. You can just go to the market and buy some. And complexity. Uh, I, I, I choose, I have chosen this particular functional ingredient, phytosterol, because of its complexity. It is not simple. Fructo oligosaccharides, inulin, considered simple. Beta glucan is simple. Phytosterol is more complicated. Okay, a role in plants, uh, stabilizing, regulating fluidity and permeability of cell membrane. That was described in the beginning, a uh, similar role. Uh, by cholesterol in animals, yeah. Mm, why are so slow? Next page. Okay, I'm trying to move to the next page. Okay, chemically. Okay, chemically, phytosterols are three terpenes. So this is what I mean by organic chemistry. Uh, you need a little information there, but it's not that important. You can just. Uh, you don't like that notes, yeah, but you need to do uh, You can just forget about it. They are closely related to cholesterol. Uh, that one is important, but structurally distinct. Uh, I'm going to show you later, okay? The structure, uh, as promised, uh, like the one in the video. Um, in order to understand, you have to see the, um, the structure. Okay. Um, what makes uh, phytosterol, example there, campesterol and cytosterol different from cholesterol is that carbon number 24, uh, campesterol has uh, methyl and uh, cytosterol has ethyl, okay? <clears throat> okay, you will find these two, uh, two, two compounds, one is sterol, another is tannols. They are, you know, like... Um, brothers they are very close together because when you when you perform hydrogenation of sterols you will get stanols and stanol is the saturated counterparts stanol is also less abundant so most of the time we talk about sterols yeah? a lot of sterols but there are stanol of course Okay, this can be uh, difficult for now. Saturation of the 5-alpha position of campesterol produces campestanol. <laughs> I'll show you. Saturation of the 5-alpha position of beta cytosterol produces cytostanol. Yeah. <clears throat> Learning outcome in, on this page is basically to understand the difference between sterol and stanol and also, um, yeah, sterol and stanol basically. <laughs> Um, all right, uh, slow, slow. This is what I mean. Um, there are way too many phytosterol, 200 over, a lot, yeah. Uh, the common one, beta cytosterol. This is beta cytosterol. This is common. Um, Avino sterol, uh, oat brand, and then campesterol, and then... Uh, Orizanol from rice, cytostanol, ficosterol, egosterol. This is minor, okay? But nowadays, uh, even the USM is doing research on this orizanol, uh, phytosterol, uh, estanol, estanol, sorry. <clears throat> but we, you hear a lot about uh, beta cytosterol, but the one in the products, a mixture of, of many things, yeah? Even the one in the, in the plants, mixture of many types of uh, phytosterols and their related compounds. So um, this is our enemy, uh, cholesterol. If you spot uh, carbon number 24, which is here, that is carbon number 24. Uh, this is campesterol, carbon number 24. It has uh, CH3, which is a metal group, compared to beta cytosterol, carbon 24 has uh, Ital group, yeah. So ital group. This is what makes the uh, 
cholesterol and campesterol and beta cetosterol different and then we when we do hydrogenation hydrogenation of this uh, uh, sterol you will get stanol you do hydrogenation of beta cetosterol here you will get cytostanol if you do hydrogenation of campesterol you will get uh, campestanol so by doing hydrogenation of sterol you will get stanol okay but our body something happened in our body that uh, make it possible to um, to compete actually this all beta uh, this all phytosterol will compete with cholesterol for absorption so in a way phytosterol will prevent or reduce absorption of cholesterol into our body i will show you later how how, how it is done okay i hope it's clear uh, um, i was talking about oh gosh this is why i do not to use this uh, slideshow <laughs> it's slow i cannot control it <clears throat> okay so this is what we were talking about, hydrogenation, and we talk about the uh, the chain substitution of metal and ethyl. Okay, in order for you to understand the structure of sterol and stanol, and how how is the structure of sterol and stanol as compared to the structure of cholesterol. So you need to uh, note the similar structures of phytosterols and cholesterol and to note the key difference between sterol and stanol. Okay, maybe some of you are still puzzled. How is the difference between sterol and stanol? Um, you see here, that is the carbon number five. Okay, for the sterol, carbon number five has that double bond there. For stanol, that, that carbon number five uh, basically has no double bond. So we, we, are, we are saying here is that the difference between sterol and stanol, oh man, is that um, we are saying that um, saturated, the stanol is the saturated counterparts, yeah, because of the absence of the double bond. So I heard everybody, everybody got this complex structure. <laughs> I don't blame you, but uh, you know, you just keep on. Uh, Maybe you can hear this lecture again. You will get it. Okay, how, how does it work? You always want to know the mechanism um, inside our body, somewhere near the uh, intestine, where the absorption happens. There will be three sources of intestinal cholesterol. Yeah, One from food, of course, or from diet, about 200 to 400 milligram per day, which is not that much. There is uh, more cholesterol in the bile uh, e that's coming up from the liver, one gram a day. And there are uh, also quite a lot of cholesterol from uh, uh, the, the layers of the intestinal lining uh, that shed, shedding uh, cholesterol away. We, uh, they call it exfoliated enterocyte, yeah? the, the cell, the lining of the cell of the intestine. So that produces about 300 to 400 milligrams of cholesterol a day. So these constitute 100% cholesterol. You can imagine if you reabsorb all of this cholesterol, it's going to be a disaster. There's going to be a lot of cholesterol in your body. Luckily, only 50% will be absorbed. Another 50% is supposed to be you know, expelled out inside the feces. So 50% will be absorbed in the intestinal lumen and then it's going to be re-esterified. I will show you the, 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 the image. Re-esterified by intestinal cells incorporated into cytomicrons and secreted into circulation. Okay, but, but to be absorbed, cholesterol must first be solubilized by my cells. This is the key. The micelle must solubilize cholesterol. So now the main mechanism, how phytosterol work. A, phytosterol and cholesterol have similar chemical structures, 
because of the similarity, they can compete. But um, the good news is that phytosterols have higher affinity for my cells. That means when phytosterol and cholesterol are competing with one another, phytosterol will always win. Phytosterol will have higher affinity for my cells and therefore uh, it makes the, uh, the remaining cholesterol we have lower solubility because the remaining cholesterol cannot be solubilized. Displaced from the mix my cells and inhibit absorptions. Okay. So that's how it works. Well, actually, there are many, several mechanisms how how phytosterol work, but uh, for our course, we get it. We're not going to know that details. It is sufficient to know how phytosterol uh, reduce the absorption of cholesterol into our body. This is sufficient, yeah. And this is how it looks like at the lumen, uh, the, the the layer, the intestine, mucosal where the absorption happen. If you can see, uh, this is where the cholesterol come uh, together with the plant sterol. So there's going to be a competition there. The micelle is here. So uh, most of the phytosterol or plant sterol will be solubilized inside the micelle, reduce, reducing the amount of cholesterol, the free cholesterol, from being solubilized by the micelle. So whatever can be absorbed into the intestine will be re-esterified and then con convert into cyclomicron for uh, circulation. Yeah. So by doing this, um, we can reduce the amount of free cholesterol absorbed. Therefore, we can reduce the risk of diseases associated with the uh, cholesterol. Okay, All right. sterile content in selected foods, uh, rice, bran oil, corn oil, sesame seed, soybean oil, olive oil, bananas, carrots. As you can see, most of the sources are vegetables oils. So now your, your functional food technologies, you understand uh, phytosterols can be considered as the cholesterol of plant. So yes, of course, the plant uh, has oil and the oil of plant or vegetable oil is zero in cholesterol. Yes, of course, but they have phytosterols. It can be 0.1 to 1% of sterol, depending. You see the rice bran is very high uh, phytosterols, yeah. <clears throat> Go again. Um, the structure is this is for organic chemists. Uh, current can just forget about that. Uh, glucoside, maybe this one okay. Esters, because esters is one that we are interested in. Uh, that is how the technology is able to to make uh, phytosterol more more able to be incorporated in food because of the esterifications. Yeah. Okay, well, cereal, nuts, vegetable, berries, other fruits may contain a uh, low amount, 0.03. Okay, uh, example of phytosterol composition of selected plants. Again, um, there is always mixtures of them, yeah? like barley, 150 to 182, campesterol, 437, cytosterol, sigmatosterol. Avinasterol and very rarely stanol. So most of the time, most of the time, the, the sterol always more than stanol. There are sometimes you will see that uh, stanol, which is the saturated com counterparts, may be present in high proportion in certain plants, but most of the time, it is it is the sterol. Uh, present in much higher quantity compared to stanol, like example given here, barley, rice, and broccoli. Okay, uh, what's number one? So number one is chemistry and occurrence. Number two is solubility. Okay, um, what is the time now? 221. <clears throat> 
Okay, solubility for phytosterol is the issue that um, limit the the how you call these applications. They are of course lipophilic, insoluble in water, uh, in fats and oils. Even though they are lipophilic, the solubility is limited depending on the oils and temperature. So, so in order for you to increase the solubility in oils. You have to increase the temperature okay in order for you to make that emulsions so it is possible to incorporate 10 to 20 percent of phytosterol into vegetable oil at 50 to 80 degrees c but the problem is it will crystallize out on cooling yeah of course it is soluble high temperature but when you cool it down that uh, uh, it, will, it will go back to become crystal at low temperature and another problem is the melting point is very high, 138 to 145 degrees Celsius. And because the melting point is high, solubility is low, yeah. But wait, technology, we have uh, solved the problem by, by doing this process of esterification of sterile. Um, with long chain uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, uh, this esterification increases solubility of in fats by about tenfold and enable incorporation into fatty foods. So this is the secret why we are having. Uh, it is now easier to incorporate uh, phytosterols into vegetable spread, for instance. Okay. And solubility increases with the number of double bonds. That means the more unsaturation, the more double bonds, uh, the, the higher the length of the fatty acid chain attached via the hydroxyl moiety, we are having lower melting point and that will increase solubility. Okay. But I, I guess you can guess now, even though this is, this look good and promising, the only problem now is that because of that PUFA, yeah, like fish oil, PUFA can be a little bit unstable. Yeah. <clears throat> so the commercial sterol esters with long chain PUFA has a melting point in the range of 25 to 45 degrees C. So that solves a lot of problems. <clears throat> Number three, uh, thermal behavior. The basic about phytosterol is that uh, Foods incorporated with phytosterol may be subjected to frying. And you know what frying do, the temperature can go up to 200 degrees C. And that can cause thermal uh, degradation. Yeah, uh, Phytosterol are antioxidative. Uh, this is another problem with the uh, plant uh, because they are behaving like antioxidant. That means, you know, antioxidant. They tend to sacrifice themselves. They tend to give away their, their electrons. You know, when you give away your electrons, you are oxidized. When you are oxidized, you are dead. So, phytosterol has that tendency to become antioxidative. Okay? <clears throat> um, especially when, when there is PUFA around. So, instead of, uh, instead of, Becoming stable, phytosterol will oxidize in order to save UFA. A good thing uh, compared to sterol, stanols are more resistant than the uh, sterol, the un unsaturated counterparts. So if you have stanols and if you can incorporate stanols into your vegetable spreads or any other uh, fatty based products, you should choose stanols because stanols are more resistant. Okay? All right, so when heated, phytosterol content may be reduced. Yes, it may form polar and non-polar compounds that can be toxic, may undergo oxidation, loses content, and yielding harmful products. Yeah. All right, so efficacy of phytosterols, uh, we're going to compare free versus uh, esterified yeah so maybe you already know as mentioned before sterol when hydrogenized 
hydrogenated produce stanol and both of these sterol and stanol can be esterified to produce uh, sterol esters or stanol esters yeah uh, in this case uh, ster uh, during esterification sterol have been shown to be stable uh, during esterification at 90 to 120 degrees celsius yeah so there's no issue then about temperatures stanol esterification is a patented is a patented process in 1989 so now you can see product uh, they're using margarine vegetable fat spreads cheese salad dressing etc by using stanol esters so now you have option you can use uh, sterol esters and also stanol esters in your products so from here you can tell um, what is more stable in terms of product choice yeah <clears throat> okay this is uh these are the um, efficacy study there are so many studies and just to summarize some of the studies um number one uh, oops what did i do number one sterile esters are equally efficacious effic efficacious to stanol esters all right so in terms of health benefit uh, they are equal whether it is sterile or stanol esters they can reduce ldl uh, daily doses about one to three grams yeah uh, based on free phytosterol this gram number two free phytosterols are as effective as esters and you need 2.4 gram per day of phytosterol enriched for example in bread cereal margarine people have done the study minimum dose of 1.5 gram sterol per day cause significant reduction in total ldl okay so what you can do later on, you can just go to the supermarket and you can choose product containing phytosterol and you can check what is the recommended daily of that products and you can estimate how much phytosterol inside the product. Do they have minimum dose per day? If it is minimum dose per day is there, that means you can cause significant reduction in total LDL. Number four. Significant decrease in CRP. This is biomarker for um, inflammation, yeah, and heart disease. Number five, free sterol, stanol, or sterol esters consumption results in eight to twelve percent reduction in plasma LDL. Okay. Six method used to incorporate phytosterol into food matrix will results in differences in the magnitude of change in circulating total plasma and lipoprotein cholesterol so it also depends on the food metrics and methods to incorporate that phytosterol well the detail i don't have but you can browse if you like okay how how a uh, phytosterol manufactured number one um, mostly uh, i think all phytosterol are obtained from soya bean and rapeseed oil and tall oil these are the, the manufacturing of uh, vitamin E from uh, soybean and rapeseed oil and tall oil. What is tall oil? I don't know. You can research that later. But we know it's soybean and rapeseed oil. So they are using soybean and rapeseed oil to produce vitamin E. And the byproducts from that is used for making phytosterols. Yeah both sterol and stanols are generally regarded as safe okay so we come to the uh, technological challenges probably the most important part of your uh, food functional food technology okay we know previously phytosterols are not soluble in water poorly soluble in fats and oils we know they are waxy they have adverse effect on sensory properties and we know at extreme thermal treatments can result in oxidation. So these top three are the main uh, technological challenges of formulation issue. I mean, you cannot just take phytosterol and you know mix with your products. You must consider several factors, and you must choose be between these two. Commercial phytosterols. Are you going to choose the free phytosterols, or you're gonna go for the uh 
the phytosterol esters, yeah, two different things. Ah, uh, the good thing is that uh, free phytosterols is cheaper. Phytosterol ester because it is, uh, you know, esterification with PUFA, it becomes more expensive. Okay, and uh, with the free phytosterol, you have issues of uh, particle size. So when you develop a products using free phytosterol, you must consider this particle size. Why? Well, like like uh, like ice cream, if if uh, if the sh the sugar inside the ice cream recrystallize, increase the particle size, people will will detect the the presence of the uh the coarseness of the ice cream that's no good so the higher the particle size the higher chances that it become coarse <laughs> but good thing uh it is more stable because it doesn't have the this uh, pufa yeah <laughs> lex pufa moiety example beta uh, cytosterol so phytosterol esters uh, it solves the problems of the uh, solubility uh, by esterification. Yeah, it has higher fat solubility, lower melting point, easier to be incorporated to formulate in, in, in fatty based food. So, because you incorporate with PUFA, now you call it uh, beta cytosterol linoleate. Yeah, this one just beta cytosterol. Uh, so, you do the uh, um, esterification, you have beta cytosterol linoleate. So this linoleate, uh, the problem is, <laughs> like any other fat, it increases calories. Therefore, it's not suitable to be used for fat-free products. See, it's not straightforward. You have to consider many factors. Uh, but if you want to make just um, low-fat spread, yes, it is possible to use beta cytosterol linoleate in your products. Again, there is a problem of oxidative stability because of this linoleate, as you know, it has double bond. It is easily uh, attacked by oxygen to cause uh, oxidation. Okay, um, problem with the um, free phytosterol, the particle size, uh, it has this effect of powder, powdery, powderiness, powderiness. Oh, that's not even a word, yeah, that's why I do that. Uh, so it gives sensory attributes like taste and texture when you put into chocolate, for instance. If you choose the high particle size 300 micron, that 300 micron will give you gritty texture like eating uh, insoluble, insoluble sugar, yeah? And, and gritty is worse than coarse. You have mouth feel issue, you don't enjoy the chocolate anymore. So um, if you decide to use free phytosterol, your aim should be uh, using the one with a small particle size, yeah? Less than 20 micron. So, specification of products, specification of raw material. So this is where you do negotiation with your uh, ingredient supplier, saying that how many percent must be below 20 micron. Uh, of course, for your suppliers, they will charge more for the 20 micron compared to the 300 micron. If you don't care about the quality of your chocolate, then it is okay to just buy the cheap 300 micron. But your consumer will, will eat uh, coarse, uh, gritty chocolates. They're not going to make a repeat purchase from you. Yeah. Okay, the challenge, um, the challenge in this, in this particular product is basically to formulate low fat i.e. what we call light food using the phytosterol esters. Phytosterol esters, yeah. That means the one that containing the linoleate, containing the PUFA. Why it is a challenge? Because we introduce uh, fatty acids. Uh, this is cholesterol-lowering low-fat product example, proactive flora, 
uh, actively lowers cholesterol, it is light, and uh, clinically proved uh, plant sterol. So very strong uh, branding proposition there. <clears throat> In order to make it efficacious, uh, you know, remember the FFC definition, uh, it has to be uh, defined efficacious. You need 12 to 13 percent petrosterol esters, which is basically bioactive compounds. The problem is it will add, it will add into your formulation about 5 percent of fat. So it cannot be a zero fat product already, it has to be only light or low fats. So the formulators now uh, have to keep the oil concentration in the fat phase uh, less than 20% in order for it to call light. This is where the challenges of formulation. Well, um, in order for us to really go into it, uh, to read the notes, actually more than this, I can give you and give you and give you, and you will not get because you don't do the formulation. So it is enough uh, for you to stop here to understand the, the challenge is there, the complexity of phytosterol, but the, the promises are there. Yeah. Okay. The issue with, with the, with the phytosterol is that if you can check, uh, the product in the market, the incorporation of sterols and stanol esters into fat spreads is protected by patents. I mean, most of the fat spreads out there, if you use sterol esters and stenol esters, for sure, these are protected by patents. Only certain company who pay for the patent rights can use this particular uh, uh, esters, yeah. <clears throat> but not free phytosterol. Phytosterol, anybody can use, yeah. They are cheaper, plus they do not have any caloric value. So, <clears throat> So it is possible to use free phytosterol, but there are several issues uh, regarding free phytosterol, as mentioned before, when you, it, the solubility issue, right? Uh, you, in order for, it, for you to solubilize it, you have to increase the temperature. But the problem is when, when you start to bring the temperature down during product, uh, during processing, during storage, you know, like fat spread people put in the refrigerator, when you bring the temperature down, it will start to become back to solid. Yeah, it become recrystallized. That is the issue with the free phytosterols. So now you know the issue, and you know yeah, there are several ways uh, in the literatures. People have done a study. They have show uh, possible ways to solve the problems of solubility, um, uh, unless you work in the spread manufacturing then uh, it is relevant to you. But for now, I'd rather stop here just to leave you with the notion that uh, uh, it is a complex product. Yeah? But uh, once you manage to develop into a vegetable spread containing phytosterols that you can claim uh, lower cholesterol, then the market, market is really good the chances of making good sales are there. Okay, guys, I think that's all for phytosterols. Tomorrow, excuse me, tomorrow we will uh, start going into the fortification. Um, you can start browsing that uh, RNI from Malaysia. Uh, the document has been given to you in your Facebook. Um, if you can finish uh, all about um, fortification, then you know most part maybe 95 percent of the syllabus are covered okay guys thank you for your attention any question recording done stop